Hi, and welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to our Skills to Work workshop. We've got a real treat of a workshop today. Uh, we're talking about shining in your job interview, and we've got a fantastic uh, guest speaker helping us out uh, today. We have Claire Carpenter. Now, uh, Claire and I were just joking that uh, all superheroes tend to have alliterative names, and Claire is an interviewing superhero. Uh, she is one of the principal consultants at Corn Ferry, which is a huge uh, recruitment agency. Uh, Claire specialises at the top level, so helping uh, boards and non-executive directors appoint just phenomenal staff. And uh, so it's a real treat for us to have some kind of behind the scenes insights uh, into how to make uh, yourself, uh, well, how to present yourself in the most effective ways possible in interview. Just a little bit of background about UKHK uh, before we dive into our content today. Uh, UKHK, as you might guess, stands for United Kingdom and Hong Kong. We're trying to build a bridge uh, to help people uh, set up life here in the UK. We're, we're working in three different areas. Uh, the first is social integration. We want to make sure uh, that you feel welcome to the UK and you make friends. And so there's two things we're doing in that area. One is we're helping people uh, with English language practice and friendship making through a welcome course. Uh, and many places around the UK are running those courses. If you want to find out more, watch your email inbox because we'll send you some details on that. Uh, we've also been having welcome festivals. So last weekend, uh, hundreds of people were gathering in Edinburgh and Bristol. And it was fantastic. Beautiful pictures of the community wrapping around, around. and welcoming Hong Kongers. This weekend, uh, if you live near Reading or Manchester, uh, we're hoping for good weather and uh, we're having massive events in uh, the centre of Manchester and the, and the centre of Reading. You would be very, very welcome. Uh, second area, so that you know, uh, we're also working at educational integration. Um, if you've come to the UK with children, we want to make sure that your children feel warmly received into schools. And uh, so we've got a national parent teachers event coming up soon. Uh, again, watch your inbox for that. But super exciting. I got this in the post today. This is the welcome book. And um, I helped write it, uh, but the best bits of it are the design. And um, Mina, who's very, very humble, is on this call. And it's just absolutely beautiful. We have just every page is chock full of really exciting things for primary school children to get their teeth into and make sure that they're excited about being here. What's the wildlife they get to discover? What are the, the new hobbies they can take up? Uh, what are the cultural places they need to visit in order to just feel like this is their new home? And it's a fantastic book and we know that you're going to enjoy it. Um, that should be available from local schools and um, if you are in a school that has lots of Hong Kong children in, uh, we're taking kind of bulk orders of 50 ago. So um, find out more about that from us later. Now, the third area and the one that really matters for us today is professional integration. And today's event is one of a series. Uh, last time we looked at um, how to build, sorry, how to write a fantastic uh, CV. Uh, we've also looked at covering letters. And today we're looking at interview skills. Uh, the next event coming up soon is talking about using LinkedIn. That's a really important uh, mechanism for uh, attracting uh, the right employers for you and to kind of put yourself out there. So uh, please uh, tune into that next time. But Claire, we're so delighted that you're able to join us. Thank you. Uh, you have the most amazing building I've ever been in, uh, in terms of a, an office building. And I know you have incredible staff that bring you, uh, you know, cold drinks with uh, lemon slices in them at the drop of a hat. So uh, we, we, we're really grateful you've given us your time today. Uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself uh, before you kind of dive into the content for us. Of course. Thanks, Chris. Um, well, as you, as you said, my name's Claire and, and I work as a principal in the board and CEO practice here at Corn Ferry. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to say hello to everyone. Um, and for those of you that have already arrived, welcome um, to the UK. I was born in London, but I currently live in a town called Broadstairs on the coast and travel up to London for work. Um, Broadstairs is right on the very tip of England, um, probably the nearest tip to France, the bottom right hand corner for those of you that likely won't know it. Um, so diving into the talk. Um, oh, sorry, Claire. One thing I forgot to mention yes. uh, is that we are really keen for questions. 
And um, if a question pops into your mind, just stick it into the chat. I will follow along and make sure that we'll, we'll answer them at the right time. Uh, just already we had a comment from Kelvin. Kelvin. Uh, Kelvin is really excited about today because tomorrow he has an interview. So this couldn't be better times for you, Kelvin. We know uh, you're going to get some good stuff and we're all wishing you good luck in your interview tomorrow. But if questions come up or something that we say, you know, Claire or I, that, that, that we've assumed you've got some cultural understanding about Britain that you don't have, no questions, too silly to ask, just dive in. And uh, if we're speaking too quickly, let us know as well, because uh, we want to make sure that you're able to get the best out of this. But brilliant. So use chat. I'll ask the questions for you. Um, but over to you, Claire. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um... So obviously Chris has done a wonderful uh, explanation of what we do at Corn Ferry. Um, and hopefully, I don't know if we can get the slides up um, or whether, uh, that's great. If we um, can move down to the second slide, there's a little bit more information about who we are at Corn Ferry. Um, we're a truly global firm. Uh, the business has a number of divisions. Uh, one of the largest being what we term executive search, um, which is placing senior executives into organisational roles, for example, the COO role or the CEO role. Um, we are ranked as the leading executive firm globally. We have 53 offices all over the world with over 7,500 employees, obviously of which I'm one. And over the last 50 years, we've helped place thousands of people into new roles um, across many, many different sectors. Um, just want to make sure, is that coming up onto the second slide, if we can move? I think we're having a technical problem with the slides. Is that right, Sam? It's okay. Shall I wait a second so we can... Oh, there you go. Now there we're we go. Moving on to, to, to me. Obviously, uh, you know a little bit about what I do at the moment, but I've spent eight years working in... Um, executive search, placing non-exec directors and chairmen onto the boards of companies across all different sectors, all different sizes of companies, from FTSE 100 chairmen all the way down to smaller private companies that may be looking to list for the first time and placing people onto their boards. And before that, I worked for 11 years as a solicitor in the City of London, focusing on corporate tax. So a completely different, completely different background. Um, it's a really interesting role where I get to assist people leading businesses uh, we all know and interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, be that a bank or a fashion company or a utility company. Um, but I've also done quite a lot of work volunteering with young people who may be struggling to enter the workplace for different reasons to help them through the interview process and set out into the world of work. Uh, what that's taught me is whatever level you may be at, whatever industry, everybody feels the same before an interview. I've seen CEOs that are very nervous. I've seen 16 year olds that are very nervous. I've been quite nervous in interviews before. Uh, there is a lot that you can do to make the process successful and ensure you present yourself and your achievements in a clear, confident manner. So I've separated this presentation into three parts. Um, if we can move on to slide five, um, the first section is preparation. So the three parts are preparation, the interview itself and post interview. And as Chris said, please let me know if you've got any questions as we go through. So I'll just wait until we can get slide five up, because that sort of sets out how I would prepare for an interview or advise someone to prepare. Thank you. Um, I think this is the key part of the interview process. Um, there's a few easy things that you can do to make yourself much more relaxed and at ease in the meeting. Um, I'm not going to tell you what to wear. I think as long as you dress appropriately, um, that's the most important thing. And that doesn't necessarily mean incredibly formally. Make sure that obviously it's ironed, looks presentable, but also what's really key is that you feel comfortable. It's very difficult to think clearly if you're uncomfortable in what you're wearing. Um, hey, a quick, you... quick question Sorry. on that. Yeah, of course. Uh, really, really helpful already, thank you. Um, just, just for gents, do, do you think a jacket and a tie is normally appropriate or do you think it's completely up to you? I mean, how, how would you play that? It's a really interesting question, Chris. I think in my day job, as it were, I would expect people to wear a shirt and a tie. Um, obviously, 
I would also argue that where there is a relevant fact, I would not probably expect people to wear a tie in the middle of summer. Certainly that's something that I observe um, in London. I think more broadly, it would depend on the role. And obviously that's quite difficult if you've not met the person you're interviewing with or the company before. So I would err on the side of caution and definitely have a pressed shirt, even if you haven't got a tie and a jacket on as well. I think when we see people with ties and jackets on, on Zoom calls, for example, that now feels a bit unusual. Um, really? Unless it's a very senior role. So I think some there is a little bit less formality than there was. I do think a press shirt is key. Um, and for example, Chris, what you're wearing, shirt, jumper, very smart, very comfortable. I think that would be appropriate for some interviews, perhaps not for more senior executive yeah. interviews. It is very difficult to say without having the context. But yeah. I think what you're wearing is clean, ironed, looks presentable. That, that's the key thing. Do, do you think it's possible to be overdressed for an interview? I mean, I always thought if, if I turn up overdressed, I could dress it down and take the tie off. But if you come underdressed, it's very difficult to kind of come up again. So do, do you think err on being, a, you know, shirt and tie, jacket, are you ever going to be wrong for wearing that? I don't think so. No, I think looking well presented is really important. It sets out who you are the second that somebody meets you. So yes, you could be overdressed for a role. And I do think that it could be difficult to take a tie off because you probably won't know how the other person is dressed <laughs> until you actually meet them. Um, so no, I don't think it is possible to be overdressed. I do think if you're using a recruitment agent, and I'll touch on this throughout the talk, it is worth asking the question beforehand. They will be able to tell you. They will have met the person in question or at least had a Zoom call or other form of virtual call to have some idea how that person is likely to dress and can give you a steer. So I would definitely recommend that as part of your preparation. Dr. Wendy Wu, who also has a fabulously alliterative name, uh, <laughs> says, how about ladies? G give us some guidance about what's appropriate for women. And, and I know we're trying not to be prescriptive, but just assume someone hasn't been to an interview in the UK before. Give us some guidance for our, our, our female friends here. I think that's an excellent question as well. And I always try to either wear a dress such as the one I have on with clean lines in a plain colour, particularly in a Zoom call, so it's not a distraction, or a, a nicely ironed shirt. And I think that's probably a call to have a press shirt um, and or a very simple dress is what I would advise. If, if you have that, whatever you have will be fine as long as you wear, um, as long as it's been pressed and looks presentable. So I think obviously it's difficult without knowing the context, but that's what I personally would wear um, and to make sure that I feel comfortable and look appropriate. Uh, it might be my internet connection, but I heard you say a pressed shirt or blouse. What, what mm -hmm. were, you, were you saying trousers as well? Or you, would you suggest a suit for women or, or never? Um, we do. Uh, we often have ladies that wear jackets as well, and I think that's perfectly appropriate. Um, I've got a number of colleagues that often wear a blouse and a jacket. Really, whatever makes you feel comfortable. If if you feel most comfortable in an outfit that includes a blouse or a shirt and a jacket, then wear it. If you feel more constrained in a jacket, um, or you, for example, doesn't fit so well, don't wear it. Wear something that is going to make you feel comfortable would be my chief piece of advice. Find something that's quite formal, looks appropriate, and then choose the thing that's most comfortable. That's really helpful. Thank you. Great. Keep going. I've, there are some other questions, but I think we'll we'll wait. It's very difficult to think when going on around you. Perfect. Thanks, Claire. So, if I move on to um, the preparation slide, oh, I think we've um, we've lost that. But shall I just continue while we wait for that to come to come back up? Yeah, I think that's right. Okay. Um, so obviously we've touched on what's where. Um, if the meeting is in person, then particularly if you don't know the area where the meeting is, plan your route and leave extra time. Um, particularly since the pandemic, public transport can take longer than one might expect. Um, I would leave quite a significant amount of time if you can. Obviously, if your circumstances don't allow for that, then do what you can. But if you arrive 20 minutes early, you can go and get a coffee and then make sure you walk in five minutes before the meeting, calm, refreshed, and ready to meet your interviewer. 
there was nothing worse than turning up late and having that added level of anxiety. So leave extra early. Um, make sure you get there five to 10 minutes before so that you can speak to the receptionist or the person that you're meeting and say, I'm here. And they can always ask you to wait for a few minutes while they ask your interviewer to join you. Um, is it is it ever possible to be too early? Like if, if you've turned up half an hour early, yep. um, is that inappropriate? I don't think it's inappropriate. I particularly think in current circumstances, when you probably don't know the area where you're going to the interview in person well, it's entirely appropriate to turn in uh, to turn up early because you're taking the process seriously and it's important and you don't know the area. So if all goes well and every bus turns up on time um, or the tube turns up on time, then you could find yourself there quite early. I've had that happen before, particularly when I'm interviewing a candidate or a client. In that circumstances, I would normally find a local coffee shop, have a coffee, sit down, and then again, walk to the building where I'm having the meeting five to 10 minutes before. But if that option wasn't available, I think it's fine to turn up early. It's, it's, it's more than acceptable to not know exactly when a bus or a tube is going to turn up, particularly with the different timetables at the moment, as I said, since the pandemic. Um, I think if the meeting is on Zoom or Teams or some other format, there's slightly different considerations. Um, make sure you get ready at least 10 minutes before. Um, if you can, shut out the cat, any other distractions. If you're in a shared space, perhaps you could ask if you could have half an hour's privacy in advance so people can either go out or maybe rearrange their own meetings. Um, what I would like to say, though, is if you can't do those things, don't worry. Uh, people are understanding, again, particularly since the pandemic, I've had colleagues speaking in their children's bedrooms. I've had them speaking from sheds at the end of gardens. I've had them with other flatmates around the table because that's the only table in the room and everyone needs to work at it. So if you can have privacy, that's great. It will make you more relaxed and you'll perform better. If you can't, don't worry about it. People will understand. Um, most importantly, and Chris and I were talking about this earlier, test the tech. It is incredible how many people realise they don't have the relevant app, the Zoom app or the Teams app on their telephone until they try to log into that meeting. Because it's gone into your calendar, or into your diary, doesn't mean that the tech will work if you haven't set it up. And I'm sure everyone's used this tech loads over the pandemic. But if you've just arrived and you've got a new phone, for example, and there's many other things to do and a lot of admin, I imagine, this is something that you could easily overlook. So make sure whatever platform you're using works, ask someone to call you on Zoom or Teams, make sure it's working seamlessly. It also gives you an opportunity to blur out the background. So if, for example, there is a lot going on behind you, if someone else is calling you, you can make sure you've set those settings before you enter the actual interview call. Um, My biggest fear, Claire, is, is an internet failure um, or a dodgy signal. And I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know really what we can do about it. Do you have any guidance at all? Uh, I've got quite a lot of experience in this situation where someone hasn't been able to join a call and you spend sort of 15 minutes going backwards and forwards trying to make it work or where there's been no audio on the call. So one person can hear, another person can't. I've had interviews where people have just disappeared completely halfway through. This has happened to everybody since the pandemic. I think make sure, if possible, that you have the person you're interviewing with mobile number in your phone so that you can text them, say, I'm sorry, there seems to be an IT issue. Shall I phone you on my mobile? And make sure you have your recruitment agent's number saved. So if you can't get through to them, you can text the other person. Um, a good friend heads up the UK Department of quite... Um, uh, a well-known brand and had exactly the same thing when was doing a, quite a large presentation. These things happen and it shows a great deal of resilience how you deal with them in the moment. Staying calm, explaining what's happened, which is completely out of your control 99% of the time and making sure the person realizes that the issue is an IT one. Can you reschedule? Is there a way you could possibly do it on a mobile or through another medium is the best thing you can do in those circumstances. It's really helpful. Um, just a question that's come in kind of ahead of the meeting. Um, someone says, uh, I will have an interview on, on this coming Friday. Would you recommend sending my reference letters to the interview panel for their reference before the interview? As I applied for this job on NHS and there's nowhere for me to upload it as supporting documents. That's a very interesting question. 
I think, in my experience, I would not send the reference letters until further into the process. Or if somebody said, have you got referees lined up? However, with the NHS and with other government portals, there's often a very formal application process, which you alluded to there, Chris. I think if they haven't asked for it, have it ready to send if they ask if you get a request between now and Friday. Otherwise, I think you can say in the meeting, I can forward these to you straight after the meeting, should you require them. I think if they wanted them, they would ask for them in advance. So I wouldn't I wouldn't be too concerned about that at the moment. And I would just more focus on the meeting itself. That's great. Thank you. Um so Talking of reference letters and CV, if you've applied with a CV, I would have a copy of it with you for reference. It is incredible when you're trying to think of an answer to a question, um, how hard it is to also remember exactly the dates of where you worked somewhere or who you worked with. If you have a copy next to you, if possible, or if you've just read it through beforehand, if you can't have a copy, it's just much easier to reference with confidence during the meeting and confidence is something I'm going to come back to a number of times during this conversation. And the other thing I would definitely concentrate on is putting some time into working out why the job appeals and and practicing your reasoning behind that so you can talk around it. So make it make it clear this is something you've thought through rather than I need a role I've arrived in the UK. That might be true, but there's many roles you could apply for. So why in particular have you applied for this one and I think that's really key to success if you practice your answer beforehand it will come out as much more authentic when you have to discuss it in an interview process and it is definitely worth spending a few minutes doing that in my experience um as I just said I, I think for many of you this situation has arisen out of circumstances that you maybe didn't foresee um and that brings different challenges to a normal interview situation but it also requires a very clear mindset. Um, while my circumstances are different, um, this is something I have experienced. Um, as I said, I completely changed my career in my late 30s in order to work in executive search as I do now. And obviously, previously I was a corporate tax lawyer, which was a completely different role with it transpired some skills that were relevant and some that really weren't, um, to my surprise. And, and that didn't need to be a negative. Um, what it meant was you really do need to think what you can bring to this role and why you were the right person. And just spending a few minutes doing that before the meeting rather than having to try to think about that in the meeting will really help you to come across in a very confident and assured manner. Um, on that point, some of you may be interviewing for a level below what you're used to or perhaps in an entirely different industry. So you really clearly need to think why this is going to work for you, what your experience will mean for the organisation, how being part of that culture is an exciting opportunity for you to grow back up to the same level. And you hope beyond it. Um, others of you may be coming back to work after perhaps maternity leave, for example. Um, one thing I would like to say about UK culture is we're moving towards a far more inclusive workplace where different experiences, cultures, backgrounds are valued. It's OK to be authentic. It's OK to explain what your circumstances are. Um, for example, the days of pretending you don't have children have largely vanished, and, and that's a real positive from the last few years, I think. Um, but there are a number of ways of doing this. So either speak with the recruitment contact that you have beforehand, so he can advise, for example, whether hybrid working is a possibility or part-time working or flexible working to suit the circumstances, whatever they may be. Or if that isn't possible, I'd probably suggest raising it as a question towards the end of the interview. Um, I wouldn't advise opening with this point, but I also wouldn't advise hiding it either. Um, if you're given some preparation material, then definitely read it. Um, even if you only have 10 minutes, there is an enormous amount you can do to prepare for an interview, to learn about the company and the interviewer um, over and above what you've been given. So everyone will get the same amount of material, one would assume, and obviously know that and read it carefully. Over and above that is up to you. And there are a few things that I would strongly suggest you do for each interview where possible. One, speak to the recruitment consultant if you have one or agent or contact and ask for any additional information or insight they have on the interviewer or the company. Um, they may well know something that isn't on that job advert. And just by asking the question, we'll probably say, well, actually, I spoke to them last week and 
they're doing this with the strategy or they're very busy at the moment on this project. And you can make a note of that and hopefully reference it in the meeting to show how interested you are in the role. Um, I think there's a way to break down the next section into general and structured preparation um, for the interview. And I think we'll dive into general first. So I think they're on the slide in front. Um, so what would my role look like day to day is a very good question. What are you working on at the moment to the interviewer? What does a day in the life look like for you? Let them talk through what they're doing, what they're working on. Um, how might I be involved in that project when they've had a chance to explain it to you? Are there opportunities for training, et cetera? But there's also more structured questions that I think are really useful to prepare as well. So for example, with the interviewer, I'd always make sure I know as much as possible about them that I can. And with LinkedIn, this makes it a lot easier to do. So I would look at when the person interviewing you joined the business. If it's been for a long time, ask them what made them stay. Why is the company so good? What is it about the culture that they've enjoyed that they've been there for so long? Is it that they've progressed? Is it they work with an excellent team? Is it that they've helped grow the company and they see it as part of their personal success? Um, equally, if they're new and they've moved recently, ask them how they found the move. What is it like to join the company? What have they enjoyed about the process? Um, interviewers are normal people, just like you or I, and like everyone, they like to talk about themselves. So this really gives you an opportunity to have a, a much more personal conversation with the person that's interviewing you, get to know each other better and get to know the company culture a lot better. Um, it's quite incredible how many few people don't look up their interviewer before the meeting. And it's often very easy to find things in common just by looking at someone's history, what they've studied, when they studied, how their career has, uh, trajectory has looked. Claire, just, so definitely just on that. Yeah. That is brilliant, fascinating. Um, I'm wondering, how, how do you bring that up and, and not look like you've stalked somebody? So, you know, to yeah. say, oh, I, I was on LinkedIn and I noticed that we both went to the same university. Is, is it that kind of a, a an intro? Uh, or do you ask it as a question and say? I think, yeah, I think that's a really good question, Chris. Um, and it's something that I did with you the first time we met that I referenced where you went to university and the fact that it's quite close to where I live, but that sort of came up quite naturally. Mm. Um, in an interview situation, I would definitely say, if someone said, oh, by the way, I used to work at this company, I'd say, oh, I saw on your LinkedIn profile that you were there for four years. Did you work with so-and-so or did you have a, okay. uh, something to do with yeah. that piece of M&A? So I would directly reference the fact that I'd looked at them and I don't think there was any issue with that whatsoever. It, it shows preparation and yeah. it shows that you're actually really interested in the person that you're speaking to and the company. I mean, I think if it comes up more naturally, that's great, but I really wouldn't miss the opportunity to say what you know, particularly if there's something you've got to say that's relevant. Mm -hmm. um, and equally, to say, well, I see you've joined the company recently indicates you've looked at LinkedIn anyway, or to say, oh, I see you've been there for 10 years. Yeah. What, what's been so great about it obviously sort of makes the point. And I think that's absolutely fine. Mm. Very good. Very helpful. Thank you. Um, coming on to the company, um, I would try and find out as much as you can about the company you're joining. Um, obvious first step, Google search. How is the company doing? Click on the news button underneath Google, see what comes up. What have they been up to? What's happening in the company broadly? Um, depending on the level of the role, I would suggest looking for the annual report. In the UK, if it's a listed company, i.e. one uh, that you'll normally have see a PLC under, one of the companies you would have heard of, say a Barclays or an HSBC or a BP or a Shell, for example, they will have to publish their annual report. So if you do a Google search, you will find the last year's report. And in there, it will be a mine of information that is super helpful for an interview. Even if you only read the first two pages, uh, so the chairman's report or the revenue for the last year or the number of employees, you'll already have a huge amount of information that you can reference. during the interview, or at least be confident. Um, it also enables you to ask far more structured questions. So instead of saying, for example, if you're, if the interviewer says, have you got any questions? Instead of saying, for example, what is the company's strategy for the next few years? You can say, I read in the annual report that the company is focusing on growing, I don't know, the wheat division, K 
can you tell me more about this? And already you sound more authoritative. It's obvious that you've done your research into the company, which interviewers are really interested to see. Um, in terms of general knowledge, as a more general note, I would be very aware of what's happening in the world so you can speak with some ease. Just read the news on the morning of your interview. Uh, the BBC website is free and has bite-sized up-to-date news articles that you can read quite quickly. Um, the Guardian is free to read online um, and that might have uh, quite a political view, but again, we'll go into some depth on the issues of the day. Um, another idea is to prepare some thoughts on the latest book or article you've read that's inspired you. And I don't mean this to be able to say, the last book I read was X, because it's very unlikely that an interviewer will ask you that question. They might do, but it, it feels a bit outdated in terms of style. But they might say to you, oh, since you've come over, um, what did you do at the weekend? What have you found interesting since you've arrived? What inspires you? And you can reference the book you've read recently to answer all of those questions. So it's a really good thing to prepare. You can sort of weave into any line of questioning almost. It covers a lot of bases and it makes you sound someone that's just interested in what's happening in the world, enjoys reading. It could be any book, um, but one that you know quite well, know who the author is, read online what the reviews of the book are so you have alternative points of view perhaps. Um, for example, I'm reading a book called How Confidence Works at the moment by um, Ian Robertson, who's a neuroscientist. Um, who explores why some people are naturally more confident than others, how you can learn to be more confident and, and why this is very helpful to being successful, but not just successful, happy as well. Um, I can share details afterwards because it's actually a really, really interesting read. Um, so I would definitely take a few of those pointers, put an hour aside and do some prep. I promise you, you could do all of that within an hour and it will be well worth it in the interview compared to probably some of the preparation that others have put into. Um, I don't know whether that's a good point to stop for questions, Chris, before we go on to the interview itself or? It's really, really good. And I'm already Googling where I can buy that book on confidence from. It sounds amazing. Such helpful advice, so practical. And, and particularly for those of us that haven't interviewed in the UK before, mm. re really, really useful. Um, a couple of questions have come up. Um, well, I'll, I'll just read them. Hello, I would like to ask if I am a part-time employee in a company overseas, will that lower my chances to be employed full-time in the UK? So you're moving from a part-time role and looking for a full-time role? Yes. I, I, I don't think that would in any way hamper your chances without knowing any more detail. I don't see why it would. Um, I think everyone has the right to work part-time for a while, take time out, come back into a, a job full time, provided you can explain very clearly why you're making the decisions you're making, then I, I don't think that should be an issue at all. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good good point. Um, that having the reason why, having the narrative to explain mm -hmm. it, why were you part time? And and what, what you were saying earlier, that we, we used to live in a culture where if you had children, you used to pretend that you didn't. That's changing now. And if, if you did take time out of a, of a full-time career in order to raise children or help elderly relatives, then that, that's something to be proud of, I think. And it humanizes you, I think, as well in some of these interview um, moments. People, I've noticed, tend to like a, a story, a, a, a connection point, you know, something that tells you more than just your CV would. So um, that, that's a really helpful answer. Uh, what about this one? Is it a must? to start at an entry level uh, if I used to be in, in a mid-management senior role uh, in Hong Kong? Do I have to start lower down the chain here in the UK? Not necessarily. It will definitely depend on the organisation and the skill set that you're bringing. Um, I've seen many people move from one industry to another, one country to another, and maintained the same level of role. I mean, obvious example would be, for example, a CFO will go from one company and it could be in, for example, real estate, and then next world could be in, in mining. Um, they'll still maintain the same level of skill set um, without having to take a step back. However, there are exceptions. So when I went from being a lawyer, where I was fairly senior, I took quite a big step back uh, to learn how to do search. 
but that's because I needed to learn how to do it. And it was relevant for me to go in at a lower level and work my way back up, um, which I have done in order to understand the skills and get the necessary experience to be able to do the job well. Mm. I'm really interested in your story, Claire. Um, when you're moving from one field to another, as actually many of my Hong Kong friends have had to, mm. they might be um, you know, skilled and qualified in Hong Kong and their qualifications not recognized in the UK. Mm -hmm. So, for example, a friend of mine was an architect and it's very difficult to transfer your architectural um, uh, skills. What, what kind of research did you do? Because you, you sound like someone that's really good at research. So what kind of research did you do as you were entering a brand new field? So, um, Sorry, I've lost you. Oh, that could be an internet issue. I hope it's my end. It was a sort of similar level to the law firms that I'd worked at. So they would have similar processes, similar scale. I felt I would feel more comfortable in the organisation, even if I didn't understand the full context, if it was an environment I felt quite comfortable in. So that was one of the choices I made that I really carefully thought through. Um, I think it's very important to be quite humble and mm. to recognise that someone's giving you an opportunity if it's in an area that you haven't worked in before. And that's regardless of your prior experience or your age or your pay before or your scale. And to really see it as an opportunity, I it was something I wanted to do. I thought I would enjoy it, I really have done. But I did need to take a step back and I, I, I did definitely do a lower level job than the one that I was used to, arguably. Um, but that was part of the process and it's something I'd reconciled with myself anyway as part of the plan uh, to change career. It's great. Just two quick ones, I think, before we, we just want to really want to hear the rest of your um, presentation as well. Um, Kelvin Chum was asking, what's the main difference in style, I think, between a virtual or face to face interview from the employer's perspective? Do the Brits <laughs> prefer a casual chat on virtual and face to face for someone more in depth? questioning well calvin you can obviously read my mind because i'm about to talk about this in the next section mm, of great. the talk um but it's a very very good point i think you really need to take your cue from the interviewer and that will change depending on the interviewer's personal style um whether they have a formal list of criteria for example the person who had a question earlier who is interviewing with the NHS, they might have a list of questions they need to go through. And it could be quite a formal, structured conversation. Other interviewers might ask a couple of questions and really be taking a view on whether you're someone that they'd enjoy working with because they already know from your CV, you have exactly the skills that they need. So they don't need to probe that. So you need to take your cue from the person that you're speaking to and however informal it is, however chatty it gets, always remember that it's an interview. These people will be taking notes, one would expect, or a mental note, if not a physical one, and they will be comparing you to other candidates. So always remember, this is an interview. Yes, be friendly. Yes, have a conversation about whatever comes up in that meeting. Just remember, what would I say in an interview as opposed to what would I say outside of an interview? And that's a really good guide to answer in the correct way, whatever the formality the interview takes. Great. Oh, quick one from um, Dr. Wendy Wu again. Um, is a mock interview with UK friends before the interview a good idea? This is a great question. So I've had friends that have come back into work after having had a period of absence, uh, one in particular after a period of absence for illness, very, very nervous. And obviously doing this job uh, asked me if I would do a mock interview and I found that it really helped them. I went through the CV, I didn't know anything about their career in great detail. I hadn't worked in the industry. It was a completely different sector to me. Um, wasn't recruitment, wasn't law. I just asked questions that I would ask if I was interviewing a candidate for a role. So much came up that he could not answer or had not thought of that when he actually did the interview, he got the job. And so I think that is a brilliant, brilliant idea. If you have friends, have the time, do it. That's not going to be wasted energy at all. Perfect. Excellent. You're obviously good at prepping people for interviews. So this is double gold that we're getting from you today. Thank you. Uh, why, why don't you carry on? I don't want to miss your 
presentation because there's a lot of questions and maybe we'll come back to them. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, the most of part of the presentation was on preparation. I, regarding the interview, the main point I've already made, um, remember it's an interview, but also remember that people make very quick first impressions. So smile, try to relax. Uh, and just remember, as we said before, everybody gets nervous before an interview. Um, I think Tiger Woods famously said, I've always said the day I'm not nervous playing is the day I quit. Being nervous is part of the process. It's completely normal. So acknowledge the nerves. Don't be distracted by them. Um, the first few minutes of an interview are likely to be an introduction. Try to relax and listen to what the interviewer is saying. Um, for some people on this call, I'm assuming English isn't the first language. So try not to rush. It's OK to take your time. Uh, think through your answers. It's also OK to ask the interviewer to repeat the question. Or it's OK if you go off on a slight tangent to say, actually, can I just stop? What I actually meant was and start again. Try to control what you're saying as much as you can and, and not to rush too much if possible. Um, we've obviously discussed how um, interviews are slightly less formal than they were. Um, so what I'd like to focus on more for this section is the confidence aspect that we spoke about before. Um, I think regarding confidence, being confident and calm is really key in an interview. Um, it's been scientifically proven that confidence boosts performance. It multiplies success. It, it sort of breeds. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy um, and it increases mental capacity so you get better at what you're doing. So try to be confident in your presentation and answers. You can do this job that you're applying for. Otherwise, you would not have got the interview. So now it's down to how you present yourself, how you answer the questions, forming that rapport with your interviewer in this stage of the interview. So if you don't know the answer, have the confidence to say, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. What would you do? Or if you don't know the answer completely, but you think something you've done in a previous role could be relevant. And I've, I've said this in interviews. Um, well, I haven't actually done that. But when I worked on, for example, I did the uh, sale of Virgin Formula One to Mar Russia when I was a lawyer. Um, I said, in that particular example, these are the legal issues that came up, which I think are pertinent. So even though I couldn't answer the exact question, I managed to bring in a different example, which showed my level of seniority and allowed me to explain something that I knew inside out because I'd done that deal from start to finish. Um, it's an opportunity to showcase something that you've done well and why you should be offered the role. So don't instantly say, I'm sorry, I don't know. If there's a way to showcase what you can do whilst answering that question, then I would always take it. Um, so if possible, take notes. Or if you can't take notes in a meeting, take notes afterwards. Write down what was said. What, what did the interviewer say? Did he say he was going on holiday next week, for example? Did he mention anything that was about to happen at the company? Are they releasing results next week? What's happening with the strategy? If you have a second meeting, for example, these notes are going to prove invaluable. And don't think you'll remember two weeks later, because if you have a number of interviews, or even if you don't have a number of interviews, just life itself will get in the way. And some of these tiny details, you won't quite remember. You'll second guess yourself whether you've remembered them correctly, and you won't have the confidence to say in the second interview, how was your holiday in Turkey? Did you have a wonderful time over the Jubilee? So just try to make a note. Um, and as I said, smile and be yourself. Every interview is a learning experience. It's an opportunity to grow your network. It's also a chance to just really understand who you are and what you want. And the next interview will be different to the one that you've just had. So I think that really that's what I wanted to say about the interview process itself. Everything you can do to prep, you will have done by then. Now it's about presenting yourself in a confident, calm way and really showcasing what you can do. So helpful, Claire. One wonderful material. Um, I, I've got a couple of questions about eye contact. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've noticed that sometimes I've I've been in an interview context where I'm trying to give everyone eye contact, but they're really looking at their their pens and papers, or I'm I'm watching them kind of lose interest, and and I'm trying to win them back again. Uh, particularly for our friends that are coming from another culture, what what do we do? What's your what's your line on on eye contact? So again, I think it really depends whether the meeting is in person or virtually. In person, eye contact is key. Um, and again, follow the interviewer's lead. And there'll be natural breaks when he writes notes or looks down. 
So obviously you don't want to stare at someone, but just behave how you would in a normal conversation. Mm. Um, don't overdo it, don't underdo it. If you look down, then that could be perceived to be nerves. If what you're saying you believe and you're behaving in an authentic manner, you should be able to hold someone's eye contact in a natural way. Virtually right. is much, much harder. And there's two things that I think are key. One, don't stare at yourself. Try and stare at the person that's speaking to you. It's so easy to become distracted and notice the fact that a book's about to fall off the bookcase behind you or <laughs> something else that you've never seen before until obviously it's on screen in front of you. If possible, try to look at yourself. Sorry, try to look at the interview and not yourself. Um, and again, try to hold eye contact as much as possible. Obviously, you can look down to write a note and then look back up again. Try and keep it natural. Um, don't overdo it, but equally, looking down all the time is incredibly difficult for an interviewer to understand who you are or how you react if you don't look up. I would have thought that would be quite negative. That's really good. Someone asked specifically about jotting down notes. Is, mm. is that appropriate? Well, the last job that I... Um, job interview I had obviously before I joined Corn Ferry I had a number of meetings um, and I think I took a note in 90% of them maybe more I felt it was important if I was asking questions about the culture of the business that I was going to join and it meant that much that I asked the question in an interview that not only did I listen to the answer but that I took a note of it as well and I, I think that's entirely appropriate it's good I, I was at an interview recently and there was not there were nine people in a circle that mm. were interviewing me live face to face and and i i wrote everybody's name down because it was the first time i was knowing who was yeah. going to be in the room and and i just did it positionally where they were sat around the table so yeah definitely um i think that was someone anonymous was asking for that um can i just pick you up on that point chris if there, there is a panel and there's a large number of people that can be an opportunity don't mm. ever see that as one should never see that as intimidating because mm. often it means there's a number of people that are all waiting for the other person to speak before asking the question yeah and you can get a bit more control than you would actually think by just sitting back and waiting for them to work out what's happening and then answer the question so yeah, don't see yeah. one should never see that as intimidating i always think actually that's an opportunity that's to see how the business works yeah that's really good i like that um Someone's asking, uh, at the end of an interview, uh, if I'm asked, do I have other interviews, should I answer honestly? They're worried that if I say no, um, that will make me look like I'm uncompetitive, but they're currently unemployed at the moment. So what, what, what's a good way out of that conundrum? Yeah, and I, it's a very good point. And the same happens at very senior executive levels where someone may have left a role, for example, if there are bad results and they've been asked to leave and they're starting to find their next one. I would advise never to lie. Don't lie on your CV. Don't lie when you're asked a direct question. It mm. will trip you up and there is no need. Yeah. You can say, I'm in a number of processes or I'm looking at a number of other avenues. Uh, this, is the inter this is the process that I'm further, furthest along in. Yeah. It's completely true, but it makes you sound engaged. If you're in a number of other processes, say, I think that's perfectly fine to say, I'm also speaking to other people. And I'm at second interview with one, I hope to find out next week. If they say, well, who is that with? That can be quite tricky because that is private information that you don't necessarily need to share. However, if this is the one job that you really want, mm. I might consider sharing that information so that I seem open and say, well, actually, it's with X company. Um, I'd prefer if you didn't share that more widely. Yes, yes, that's good. This this came up in a number of our um, other seminars, particularly on CV writing. Mm -hmm. um, someone's saying, I find it difficult to sell myself at an interview. Uh, I'd like to obtain some advice from Miss Claire. Uh, what, what would make me set apart from other candidates? Um, how, do I, how do I do that without, I guess, boasting about who I am it's it's a really good point and it's really difficult to do everyone can tell when someone's selling them something and you might be in an environment where that's appropriate in an interview you sort of need to do it without making that completely obvious and so I would go back to my earlier part of the talk in terms of preparation have a huge number of examples of what you've done brilliantly so that you can say oh that reminds me of when I did x 
it's it's not the same as saying I'm the most phenomenal person at doing whatever the role is. It's linking your success to a company's success, linking your success to how well a project went. It removes it just that one step because you also do need to show what you can do and not feel that that looks too egotistical because you are in a situation where other people will be selling themselves and you need to be able to do it in an authentic way. So obviously it's true and relates to your CV. And if you've prepared it in advance, it's much easier to pull those examples out of the hat rather than just coming across as inauthentic and over the top. It's really good. Another person is asking, can I request an in-person interview rather than a, a, a virtual one, um, particularly as it will help me understand the culture of the prospective employer better? This is a conversation definitely to have with your recruitment co contact because they will know whether that person lives in the middle of nowhere and wants to get 15 interviews done in one day because they're flying to Australia the next day to sign a deal. And actually meeting in person would be completely inappropriate and make you look as if you're asking them to do something that really doesn't fit their timetable, potentially. Mm -hmm. Other people would be really happy to do it. But I would gen generally, particularly on the first meeting, take the lead of the interviewer. Mm -hmm. If they've asked for it on Zoom, do it on Zoom. You can always say, I would really enjoy meeting you in person. Obviously, I'm new to the UK. Um, that would be really great if you have the opportunity at the end of that meeting, but I would follow what they request at yeah. the beginning. Good, L lots of quick fire ones here, I think. Uh, I'm an engineer in Hong Kong currently. I'm wondering when I'm applying for an engineering post, uh, will I be asked very technical engineering questions or will it be a kind of more general uh, interview? I would say if you're doing the role already, you can answer those technical questions. Don't worry, it's unlikely to happen. Um, the first interview is normally a conversation to see about cultural fit because they'll know from your CV that you can do it. If they do ask technical questions, it's no different to being in the office and someone coming in and asking you a technical question. If you can answer, answer. If you can't, just say, I could come back to you on that point. I did actually have that situation arise once. I can't exactly remember what happened, but actually it does remind me of when I did X, Y and Z and use that other example that we were talking about earlier. Do what you would do at work. It is no different. You've done the role before. Yeah, really good. Um, here's one. I found that before I got a job in the UK, there are more recruiters who are sending me LinkedIn messages uh, for job vacancies. Um, is this normal in the UK, the use of LinkedIn? Yes, it is. And it picks up a point that I was going to make in relation to uh, the post interview section if I could just raise that now Krish which Please. is absolutely connect with people on LinkedIn the only way people can find you is on LinkedIn often other than organizations such as this but most people will use LinkedIn recruiters will have it on the screen in front of them so mm. if you send them a message it could well pop up in front of them and get their attention see LinkedIn as your friend contact and make friends with uh, the recruiting people that you speak to but also after an interview message the person who interviewed you if you can get their personal details to say thank you for the interview ask to connect with them on LinkedIn to build out your network it's really key that you start doing this particularly as you're moving to a new country and that would be considered perfectly normal within the UK I do think and, and, and I know this marries very well with Hong Kong culture manners are so important in this process be nice to absolutely everybody, whether you're successful or not, they could be really helpful to you in the future. The recruitment agent could be asked two days after you're unsuccessful in one process, do you, do you know of anyone we can quickly employ in this situation? And if you've been kind and said thank you and, mm. and treated them the way you would the interviewer and everyone else, that your name is much more likely to go forward. They are your greatest advocate in the market. Just bear that in mind in every interaction you have whether it's positive and you get the job or negative and you don't. Here's a good one. Um, do you have any advice when the interviewer asks for expected salary? This is very tricky. It's very tricky. If it isn't set out on, if there isn't a sort of um, amount set out on the job advert, I would definitely speak to the recruitment consultant prior to the conversation to get an idea of what they're looking to pay. 
you don't want to undersell yourself. Um, you will be asked probably what you earned and what that equates to in the UK previously. Mm. Um, if you're not sure and you haven't had an opportunity to have those conversations, for example, you couldn't contact the recruitment person, it's not on the advert. I think it's fair to ask for something commensurate to your level of experience and how it applies to the role in the UK. Mm. I think that is a nice way of saying that you want to be paid what you're worth um, and also putting the ball back in their court rather than setting out a figure that could really limit you in further conversations. Mm. I, I mean, is that part of your research as well you might look at what other people at a similar level are paid or is it better to not mention numbers at all well i think particularly in my role board fees are often set krish so we often don't have to actually negotiate salary so much and it would be set from the outset that and i think board directors often won't take a role purely just for the salary but i do think when we're talking about about a broad range of roles at different skill levels across many different industries and sectors if this information isn't available to you, I definitely, as, as a first step, would try to bat the ball back into the other person's court and say, what are you looking to pay for this role and what would be commensurate to someone with my experience? However, I'd also say from a cultural perspective, that conversation is probably likely to happen after the interview rather than yeah. talking about it in the interview. I think it's extremely unlikely that someone would ask you that question in a first meeting. So you should have an opportunity to at least get some sense of the figure beforehand. Yes, that's right, isn't it? Often that negotiation will happen after the deliberation and they're actually offering you the job. So uh, really well said. Claire, you've had so many lovely comments. Uh, we're really grateful for your time. Uh, thank you. You've given us real wisdom. And, and I've, I've learned a lot as someone who's, who's applied for lots of jobs in the UK. So I know my friends uh, from Hong Kong will have picked up a lot from this too. So thank you. And uh, to all our, our guests that have joined us today, wonderful uh, to see you. Uh, thank you for being part of our event today. We have a really special event coming up on the 14th of June. Uh, it's a careers day online. And some of you are thinking about changing new careers. We're going to have people from a range of different backgrounds talking about uh, where some of the skills gaps and job opportunities are in the UK. So 14th of June, get it in your diaries. You will get an email uh, after this event that will remind you of that. And we also have our LinkedIn event from someone who works at LinkedIn. So uh, you've heard from Claire how important LinkedIn is to recruitment over here. Uh, but Claire, any last words to our, our guests you'd like to say? It's been, it's been a real pleasure and I would take the interview process as an opportunity rather than something to be anxious about. If you don't get a job, don't waste energy worrying about it. Use the energy that you have to apply for the next one. And that would be my greatest piece of advice. And good luck. Excellent. Well, we're grateful. You might get some applications at Corn Ferry from uh, Hong Kong because uh, we're, we've been really delighted to work with you. Thanks for your time and your energy. and. Uh, just your your lovely manner so friends we'll see you again in two weeks time at the next one of these and uh, if you want to uh, you know there's the QR code on the screen for you uh, so you can join us at the next events but thanks for being part of this we'll see you all soon thanks <laughs>